Welcome to the Sober Nation FM podcast, where we're putting recovery on the map. I'm your host, Jonathan Sylvester. This show is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Do you want to take your recovery to the next level? Do you want more support, community, and fellowship? Sobriety Engine is an incredible free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. You can get a ton of great tips, resources, and guidance to help you succeed in recovery and in life. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. Sober Nation FM is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle all while supporting your sobriety, then you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave a review. Nation, let's hop right into today's episode. Today, I'll be speaking with coach and writer, George Kalansis. Thanks for coming on the show, George. Hey, what's going on? Pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. And, and we got connected a few years back. We actually had the same business coach, and I'm really glad uh, that we were able to link up to do this so that I can learn more about your story along with the listeners um, I want to jump right in. Where did your relationship with addiction actually start? Would you say? Whew, man. Uh, it definitely started when I was a young teenager, for sure. Um, you know, go before I was going into high school, I was that young, like the kid who was smart, quiet, wasn't really sure of himself. And, you know, I can't say I had like a horrible childhood, um, but I definitely had some things that bothered me, you know, feel of uh, abandonment and rejection and things like that. So in order to stifle that, that feeling inside, uh, when I was younger, I just worked a lot for the family, right? I just kind of shut my mouth and, and, you know, I was told up to grow, grow up and be a man and, uh, you know, words of wisdom from a father for sure with no bad intent, but it kind of like, you know, put those, those motions in my head where like, man, am I not good enough? Like, what, what does it mean? And so when I got to high school, this is in the nineties, you know, uh, so you get exposed to all those types of crowds, the jocks, the, 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 the punk rock people, like everything. And, and I didn't really know who I was. Um, and so go into sophomore year, I was turning 16, getting a car, um, working for my uncle at a tanning salon and enter parties and, and beer and drugs and all this stuff. And next thing I knew, like, I thought if I could be involved with this stuff, that would make me cooler. And it did temporarily. Right. But it never really faced my, um, feeling of feeling like worthy and rejected. So that continued well on into high school. And thankfully I talk about this in the book, like I made it out alive. I made it out with no overdoses. Uh, I never got arrested. Plenty of my friends did. Uh, but then um, going into senior year of high school, all the friends are like, yeah, we're going off to colleges doing all these things. And I'm like, what? I didn't apply to college. I don't know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they had like a homecoming carnival. Do you remember those? Like where the carnivals, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. so they had that, they had that thing and there was a recruiter's booth at the Marine Corps and uh, we're going around and I was drunk at the time, but I got up there and did seven pull-ups and I was 17. And next thing I know, I woke up hungover with a card in my pocket that promised me to change my future. And so that was the first uh, battle with trying to overcome that. And, um, you know, that worked for a little bit, but in the Marine Corps, I faced death, which, uh, definitely took a toll on side. My, my best friend got killed in the Iraq war. And um, rather than face those feelings, I turned towards addiction again. And that was a battle for a long time in the Marine Corps. I got a DUI, got in trouble with some alcohol in and out. Um, in the Marine Corps, I never did drugs. And then that just, just fed into it for many years after the service, uh, even upholding um, the identity of Marine Post, even, you know, being a coach, like, because I was a Marine and trained myself to, to go pretty hard. I could, I could drink a lot and no one would know. And so I had a silent addiction where no one really know. I'm sure my ex-wife knew, um, but you know, we didn't know how to communicate it or talk about it. I was just going through life and the bills were coming in and nothing was getting damaged except me internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't realize that I had the biggest addiction problem until post-divorce when I started going out every night, I was doing Coke. I was doing all these things that just kind of like fed into the adrenaline rush to keep going on life. And uh, eventually that led me to a dark place. And uh, you know, I found myself in a, an empty parking lot with a gun to my head. And, uh, you know, 
something saved me that day of higher power. I'm not sure what, but since then I haven't had a, a drink drug or anything or any suicidal thoughts. So, wow. Wow. That's a long story short. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's powerful stuff, man. I appreciate you, uh, you sharing that. And I appreciate the, uh, the honesty, cause that's just some, you know, that's some real shit. And I know that, uh, that our listeners, um, can certainly understand that, you know, and, um, you know, the, the, a big part of the reason that, that I do this podcast and, and we put this out is because, you know, I think that when we go through these things, like we feel so alone, right? Like, man, I'm just kind of like putting myself in that parking lot that you were just describing. And it's such a lonely feeling. Right. And, um, and we think no one else understands this. And, and what I've learned in this deal is that like, Hey man, I, I went through this stuff because one day there's going to be someone else that's gone through that same thing. And they're going to be like, wow, you know, I thought, I thought I was the only one. Now I, I do want to ask, like, do you want to, uh, you know, and th this is up to you if you want to share this, but would you say that you were kind of going through some PTSD and stuff like that due to your time in the service and, and everything you saw and your best friend dying, would you classify it as that? I mean, yeah, I guess any, I mean, PTSD can be described as so many different things. So right, uh, right. yes, technically I am uh, medically diagnosed with uh, major depressive disorder. Okay. Okay. And so here, here, the, the thing with that is to be truthful. And I talk about this in the book mm -hmm. is that I fought that my entire life. And mm -hmm. so if you know anything with addictions or any type of feeling, if we repress it, the more it comes alive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And for people like us, because we're similar, or if you're an A type driven person, you tend to repress those emotions with uh, masks that are hidden by perfectionism, by overachieving and all of these things. Right. And so on the outside, it looks great, but on the inside, it's very dark and gruesome. Mm. Yeah. And so that's how I felt for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. So uh, you have this moment where, you know, you're getting ready to take your own life something intervenes what happens from there i mean there was kind of this you know higher power moment or whatever you want to call it like what what is the the shift towards recovery or is it immediate or is it just what's going on after that so that day um you know i i i think the the unconditional love of my daughter saved my life and put me on this path that i'm on today um that's, that's what I believe in. And I'm going to keep that in my heart because it makes me feel good. But the path to where I'm at today was not easy. And I knew that I couldn't do it alone. So that, that day in the car, I called some of my really good friends. I, I texted some old mentors and I said, I'm, I had a gun to my head. I, I don't know what's next. Like, what do I do? And they're like, they talked to me for a little bit and I found some people and within a month, you know, I was with mentors and therapists and coaches and just working out my life together. And in that process, I realized that I needed to cut unhealthy coping mechanisms for my life. Um, I did, you know, David Goggins says it really well, the more hardships you experience in life, the eat, maybe it's not easier, but the better you can pull from your experiences to know you can make it through. So at that point, I had people to help me see that and that I was able to be better than what I was resorting to. And I never want to go back. Mm. So, wow. So you, uh, you, you stop drinking, you stop doing drugs. I mean, that's easier said than done for, I, I think for most people, right. It's like, yeah. you know, cause I, I know that, uh, there was a long time where I was like, okay, I, you know, I don't really want to do this anymore. And I think that I get this moment that you're describing though, and this help that you had, um, and kind of people giving you this clarity of like, Hey, this is what's going on. This is why you're doing these things. Um, but what did, what did that actually look like? Like the not mm. drinking or getting high anymore? I mean, what, you know, what, what, what were the, the actions that you took in, in lots of nights on the, on the bathroom floor crying, mm. lots of crying. Like, I mean, I, I was like in a ball shaking when I didn't have my daughter, like just like utterly tears and sn snots and, and just working out and just like letting it all go through because I never felt it before. And so my suffering needed to come through. And the only way that I could let it come through was 
by actually crying, by hiring people. And in that process, it was about two and a half months post, I went to a retreat. I went black, like blackout, meaning I, I shut off my social media, shut off everything. I didn't tell anybody except my daughter's mom where I was going because she needed to know. And uh, I, I didn't tell my, my job. I was in work for Equinox. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my clients. I just dipped out. And um, that retreat, the parts of me that needed to die, died there. Mm, wow. It was a spiritual retreat, yoga, meditation, uh, deep breath work, all the things that allowed me to detach from the lifestyle, you know, like that it was, I had done my call to action, right? The hero's journey. I needed that, like to walk through the cave. And so that retreat was me walking through the cave to only take what I needed. And in that process, the breath work and stuff, I came out a new man. Wow. Wow. That's, that's pretty incredible. So early on, I mean, you're, you're distra- you're describing, you know, these tough nights and then you, you go to this retreat, clearly you're doing a lot of work on yourself during this initial process this uh next initial part of the journey as you described it what would you say the biggest struggle was the biggest struggle was like i wanted to run and running to me was getting wasted or getting high or even leaving my daughter behind right because i didn't i didn't want to face the pain of I felt like a failure from divorce, even though I wasn't. And I felt like a failure in life because everything was, my story had crumbled in front of me. So this identity that I had upheld, people had to know the truth. Okay, I was a drunk. I was an addict. I was an asshole. All these things that no one really knew. And so that was the the biggest fear for me is that I had to slow down and face all that and see that I actually wasn't any of it. But it was the truth that I did have these problems. Yeah. And that's why to me is very important to have like someone help me, like, you know, as a bit, just like a business coach, the same thing, like this, this human was his name is Trevor Bolham, man, uncivilized, like was able to help me see all this and be there with me on a weekly basis, sometimes daily. Wow. Yeah. That that's awesome. Yeah. And, and I think you said it, you know, no matter what someone's uh, recovery, you know, looks like, whether it's just having mentors, coaches, uh, you know, therapy, 12 step program, smart recovery, you know, no matter what it, what, what it is, I should say. Um, I don't think that I've ever talked to anyone that was like, I, I've talked to very few people. I'll put it that way. That was just like, yeah, I just did this alone. You know, like it was all yeah. me. You know, and I, and I was able to do it because it's so easy for, for someone else to kind of see what's going on. Right. It's like, why is it so difficult for us to, to see these things sometimes? Do you think like to see just like where we're making these wrong turns and how we're self-sabotaging and like, what, why do you think that is? It's so tough to see that. Ah, such a good question. I, you know, self-sabotage, it, it's a normal thing to being human. But I think when it comes to these deeper issues, uh, it comes from the way that we were taught growing up and what we saw to believe and to be true about life. So it's a generation of things that occur, hmm. right? So if we're able to break that pattern to be that transitional character in our life, that's when we can break the mold and that's when we can stop. But that is I think that is something that we do. It's a lifelong process. The battle between our inner and outer worlds and never stops. Hmm. Right. And the, the Bhagavad Gita talks about this all throughout the, the, the verses. And so I think that when people find AA or they find church or they find God or find something, it's, it's their ability to surrender to something greater to themselves, to understand that you're not in this alone, that the battle that you face is more of a reflection of your, your inner beliefs about yourself. And so addiction comes from suffering, right? We don't just like wake up one day and say, yeah, we're, we're addicted to things. We mm-hmm. tend to get addicted to things to run from things that we're suffering from, the pains that we feel. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so that's, that's what I believe it's hard because of that, because we're just not taught that way. Yeah. And so I grew up in a family where feelings were uh, non-existent, firstborn son in a Greek family, European, very hardened and stuff. And my mom was figuring out her own life. So I felt abandoned, rejected. And that I thought that a man was someone who worked his ass off, didn't have feelings, was very stern. Therefore, that's how I would show up in life. And so it came out. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now you have a program. We're we're talking about tr- tough transitions here, right? Like, yeah. And uh, and I think we've probably been through a couple of those. You know, you mentioned uh, obviously we're talking about you know you getting sober, and uh, you mentioned your uh, divorce, which I know you've been you know very open about. Um, you have a program called the Art of Tough Transitions. Um, what's that, what's that all about? Yeah, so it's interesting because uh, you know, like you, I was I was just purely fitness for a long time, and, and I learned a lot about people and things like that. But before it even became what it is today, it was just me writing poetry and me releasing things that were heavy. And then in that process, people are reaching out to me and saying, like, I really like what you're doing. Like, can we talk? And then we started co- talking, and it stemmed into a group coaching program last year. Two of them I ran. And then I took a little break to finish the book. And now the art of tough transitions is a place where people come to see that they're not alone in the world, that whatever they're facing, they can get through it because they need to be seen. They need to be heard and they need to be witnessed, but you can only do it as, as, as a, as a community, as a collective, so you can't do it on your own. Yeah. What, what are some of these? I mean, obviously we just, you know, name, name two, you know, uh, getting sober, of course. Uh, going through a divorce. What are some of these other transitions that, that people are trying to work through? I mean, who, who's not trying to work through a transition, but you know, you think about, I think about, so just to clarify, not those really hard traumatic events, like, you know, physical abuse, rape, things like that. Those are very deep. And you, I believe you need to work with someone that's really professionally qualified to go through those. Like I did, I'm talking about those perpetual struggles in life you know, when you hit a divorce, like, yes, it sucks, but it's probably an accumulation of things that you did not want to face in the process or, or struggles in your career, right? Why you can't get promoted, why, why you got fired, why you're never able to go start that business, um, your finances, these things, right? These are the common transitions that we face, right? And so the toughest day of your life can, can mean so many different things. And to me, the transition occurs when you finally accept your story rather than try to rip it out. Mm. And you could probably turn to this. I know, like I'll say when I was in the, the business coaching program, I was so attracted to the six figure number. Right. And I did hit that. Don't get me wrong. But it, it wasn't because of all that. It was because of all the knowledge I already had inside and that I just kind of followed the system. But in that process, I burned myself out because I was idea like, OK, do this six figures and it stays there. Right. But we both know that's not true. <laughs> So the same thing, right? So when you can accept your life story rather than try to rip it out and run, then only you can begin to navigate the tough transitions that come into your life. Yeah. Does that make sense, Connor? Yeah, absolutely. And so when someone is faced with one of these tough transitions, uh, yeah, and, and I think you kind of said that, like who's not faced with with something, right? And and I, I absolutely get what you're saying. I mean, um, I think, you know, through having, uh, you know, through being in a 12-step program, through just like being around other people in recovery, uh, you know, people that just know more than I do in general, um, you know, like having a sponsor, having mentors, having coaches, like you were just talking about, being around other people, like one of the biggest benefits isn't just like, Hey, I'm not alone or like other people understand this. It's that they can help you to see like who you really are in a sense. Right. And like, Hey, you have, yeah, maybe you're going through this stuff right now, or you've been struggling with this, but look at all that you've learned, like kind of just that little perspective switch, right. That can go such a long uh, such a long way. And when you're like deep in all that stuff, it's so hard to see how any of it can be good. Right. But so let, let's say that someone is facing one of these tough transitions. They have no idea like what to do. Where, like, how do you start? How do you, how do you begin to pull yourself out of this? Oh, a very good question. So many different ways to do it. I would say if one has the ability to, like, it's not a Let's say it's not like the most imminent or life-threatening transition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If it's more of those perpetual struggles that we were talking about. Right. I would say that one has to learn to get out of their head and into their body. And the only way we can do that, I believe, from my, my own experience and through studying and reading and writing the book, 
is to trust yourself in the unknown. And you do that by taking one breath at a time. So what are we talking? Are we talking about mindfulness? Are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, I guess it could be considered mindfulness, but what's okay. mindfulness anyways? It's it's the ability to sit with your yourself with no judgment of what is, right? Mm. Some right, give or take. Yeah. Um, so it is a form of mindfulness, but it's more of like most of the time when we're facing these transitions, we're so caught in our head and we're disconnected from our bodies. We run around, I call it a headless human. We run around like uh, like our heads over here, our bodies over here, and we're, we're doing the total opposite. So what we got to learn to do is slow down, connect with your breath, right? And then that will allow you to start being aware of what you're feeling and to be able to, to pick up the pieces and to be able to take the next step forward. But without, without like getting into your heart to get into your body, you're never going to be able to navigate that, that transition. It will keep coming up over and over similar to addiction, right? Maybe you could say like, okay, I, I quit. Cool. I quit. You know, you do it, you do it by yourself. And then next thing you know, you have a relapse again, but you keep having relapse and relapse until you realize like, okay, I need a group. I need a, a, a program. I need to have something to surrender to. Right. Same thing. Yeah. You're, you're mentioning, I, I don't want to just like slide right through this. You've mentioned this breath work a few times and, and I'll just be honest, you know, I, I haven't, uh, jumped into that very much like i've done some like really basic like uh wim hof exercises and things like that and i always like to try to like bring as much value or as many tools to the podcast you know because i, I think what's really important in this is that you know a, a big part of of recovery is being open-minded to new stuff right sure. and uh that no matter which direction you decide to go with this and i think that one thing that's been super helpful to me and, and when I talk to other people, they're like, yeah, you know, I tried a bunch of different stuff. I just, you know, I tried stuff to see, you know, what kind of fit me, what I, what I felt like, you know, worked, so to speak, or was most beneficial for, for someone that is listening, knows nothing about breath work or anything like that, because it sounds like it's been super, super helpful to you. Like, where would you start with that? And like, what are just some of the benefits with, with that? Would you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So great question. Um, breath work can go in so many different ways. And if you really want to get more into it, pick out the book, you know, Breath by James Nestor. I don't know if you've read it yet. Mm -mm, no. it's, a, it's a great book. Um, I'll, I'll send you the, you know, the Amazon link to it. Um, but he has so many different methods about breathing and why it's important and how to really basically reduce sympathetic tone in your body to learn how to get out of the fight or flight response and into a more like relaxed state. Right. So that's one of the benefits to do that. But the deep, deep breath work that I, that I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert about that. So I, I, I don't feel I'm not qualified to really talk about that, but what it allowed me to do is, and I, I wrote a whole entire story on it. Um, I'll send you the link. If you want readers can read it. It's up on medium, essentially allow the deep breath work allowed me to access parts of my brain that were shut off from the pain that I felt a long time ago, because I was in a repetitive state of go, 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 right? I didn't know how to turn off and that didn't allow me. So there's a lot of research out there that shows that the deep breath work that I did in the, in the, um, in the, in the retreat, it's like tripping. Like you access parts of your brain that go into like a holistic version and you're able to like see things. So I had flashbacks. I had deep sweats. I broke out on uh, tears. I felt like I was in war, all these things that I couldn't do. And it was legitimately happening because it, it, it got so deep in the nervous system that I was finally able to release it. So that is very intense for someone just starting out. The best way to do it, it's, um, it's called box breathing or 16 seconds of clarity. It's, it's really, really simple. I like 16 seconds of clarity. It sounds cooler than box breathing. Um, but box breathing is just, you imagine a box. So you, you just sit with yourself and you, you, you take some time. It's 16 seconds. It's all you need. Uh, essentially two breaths. You're going to take a breath in for four seconds, hold at the top for four seconds, release slowly for four seconds, and then hold at the bottom for four seconds. And this was derived by Navy SEALs and snipers and all these things. Mm -hmm. it, it, it allows you to really get out of your head and into your body. And if you do just 16 seconds, which is just one cycle of breaths, you're going to have a lot more clarity into what's going on versus being reactive. So that's one of the biggest benefits. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I know, look, like I know there, uh, when you're describing, 
you know, going into like almost like hallucin hallucinations and stuff like this is not to like get high or anything. Like you said, it's it's to kind of like tap into uh, some of the stuff that that are because our minds are just so good at locking this stuff away. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you mentioned just like, you know, being uh, sexually assaulted as, uh, you know, when you're younger or something like that. Like I, I've talked to a, a bunch of guys that, uh, you know, didn't even remember some of this trauma that happened to them when they were kids, um, you know, for years, like literally had just tucked it away so well that it, they had almost just completely forgotten that, that anything happened. I have done the box breathing. Um, I'll just say this about the, the breathing. Um, cause I do meditate regularly. I do try to breathe more. One thing that I notice is that I'm just like naturally, I think a shallow breather, which is certainly yeah. in times of higher anxiety, especially before getting sober. Oh man, that just made things so much, uh, so much worse. So yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really cool, simple tool to use that, that box breathing. And it's one of those things like, yeah, someone might try it and they might not really be into it. But I think it's one of those things it's that's certainly worth giving a shot, you know, because um, there are just so many benefits and it's such an easy, such an easy thing to do. I think you said it earlier, right before we went into it, you have to be if you really want to navigate tough times. And I think if you really want to own your recovery, mm. you have to be open to interpretation of life every single day you wake up. Yeah. What's it? You start day zero, right? Day zero. Mm. Every day you wake up. Yeah. I like and the only way to do that is by being open to interpretation. So if meditation and breathing is, is foreign for you, fine. Start with two breaths. Start with one breath. Put your hand on your heart and feel that. And ask yourself, who, who are you? You know, I was on a podcast with Leela Dela. She's my she was one of my mentors at the at the retreat, and she's become a good friend. And we were talking about this. Like so many people are afraid of who they are underneath the mask underneath the shields they wear. So one of the uh, transitions that I mentioned that you've been through, and, and again, you've been pretty open about is, is going through divorce, which I'm, you know, absolutely 100% sure that some of our listeners uh, know a, a little something about what, what would you say you just learned through that whole process? Like in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess just how, again, just how to deal with these transitions and, and about yourself. Hmm. So divorce was like the icing on the cake, right? <laughs> all, this, all this stuff was like underneath it all, the addictions, the depression, and the divorce was just like, boop, last bit, nowhere yeah. to go, nothing to decorate. So um, this is hard to admit. Though I don't condone the way that things went down, but after doing a lot of reflection and writing and having someone, I had the heavy hand in how it went down. Meaning I got to a point in my life where I became that, that man that was so hardened, driven by like ego and, and chasing life on the surface rather than allowing myself to go deeper. So after a few years of marriage and I had, we had the daughter, like I had the good money, the, the kid in the house and all this stuff, I thought life was set. And so I basically, the, the Gottman's Call, call like criticism content the, the four horsemen like I did that a lot right and I created these imaginary checklists in my head so when things would be go wrong I would blow up then I'd drink or I'd watch porn or do something that was like completely out of alignment with what I really wanted inside mm. and that in turn created her to seek attention elsewhere and in the end you know our marriage didn't work out and so I learned in the process that Communication is key <laughs> and you, you can't hide what you're feeling, right? And if, you, if you're afraid of basically how you feel has to be far more important, then you'll never get to feel the way that you want to feel like that feeling of rejection or that feeling of what if, right? And so that's what I learned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was so afraid of saying what I was feeling the whole entire time that I was tired that I was exhausted, that I couldn't do this online business anymore. I couldn't hold all the six figures together. I needed a break. I was afraid that I would, that she wouldn't leave me all the stuff in turn. It went that way anyways. 
right? Yeah, communication. No, that's that's a that's a really good point there. I do want to ask uh, because I know you talk about a lot of this uh, in, in your book that you're working on, Nowhere to Go, which uh, I think you mentioned is set to be released in August or early September. What is the book about? Who is the book for? Yeah, so this this book is about really understanding how to navigate those toughest days that we just talked about that you as the reader can pick your journey in the book by simply understanding where you're at. So the book is not a five-step process or do this or do that. It's poetry coupled with essays to help you find what you need to feel in order to navigate that tough transition. Mm -hmm. So this book is for anybody who's depressed who's going through heartbreaks, who's going through addictions, struggles, or any tough times that are in their lives that make them feel lost and where they want to run, this book will help you slow down and to really get out of your head and into your heart so you can really move into the future with strength, optimism, dignity, and become the best version of yourself. Wow. I love that. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I want to ask if you can tell us, and I think you've touched on a little bit, but a little about what you're uh, recovery for you looks like today. Yeah, sure. Um, to be truthful, I thought about having a drink, uh, two weeks ago. I was stressed. You know, I had COVID in February, uh, co-parent, it was difficult. Finances came up with the, the, all these things, the books coming out. And the first thing I did was reach out to my little brother. Uh, and I texted him just because it made me feel like I was, wasn't alone. I just texted him and, you know, I just chatted him how it did, gave me someone to connect with. And then after I felt that I actually went to get a workout in. And then the next day I called my coach to schedule a therapy session. Right. So I, I guess for me, it's become more of a thing where I'm aware of what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And instead of trying to, to like give into that awareness or, or try to fight that, like I reach out to someone immediately so that I know that I'm not alone Yeah. before I never reached out to someone if I was feeling that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you touch on something that, you know, I, I think maybe took me a little longer to understand than, than it probably should have. Um, and maybe someone mentioned it, you know, like somewhere along the way and me going to 12 step meetings or something like that. But I think that I was under the impression that when I got sober and I was serious about it and I was working some kind of program and I was doing all the self-care stuff and, and that at a certain point, I just wouldn't think about drinking or getting high again. Mm. Um, like not true. Like I, I will say that, that now coming up on almost eight years, I think it has been like, I'm very grateful. It's been a long time since that idea popped into my mind, but man, like we did what we did for so long. Um, and and I'm right there with you. Like this all started as like, you know, early teens and stuff like that. It's so ingrained in our habits and our way of thinking, like, those first couple times that, that I did what you described, like, you know, life was happening and, you know, that thought comes into my mind. I think the important thing that I learned was number one is, is it, it's not the first thought, right? It's the second thought. Hmm. Like, and so the first thought came and thankfully, because of what I was doing, like in your case and these new tools that I was using, the first thought came and the second thought was basically, wow, that first thought was really fucked up. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like not a good thought as opposed to going into like planning or, or anything like that. You know, how am I actually going to follow through with that? Um, but, you know, I will say that when early on, I, man, I, I kind of beat myself up about having that thought again, like thinking like, OK, I've been sober, whatever it was, a year or two years or whatever this saw came like, man, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even be thinking about that anymore, you know? And I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, yeah. So, I mean, it, giving uh, as men, it's so hard to give ourselves self-compassion in the first place, yeah. but um, it's interesting because what I'm learning is to understand the difference between the thoughts 
and that those thoughts do not make up who I am as a human mm. as right now. Mm. I can have a thought, but that thought is not indicative of who I am and how I want to show up the world, right? There's a di difference between that. So I need to understand that, okay, that's a thought. This is who I am right now. This is part of me that, that just wants to come through because a feeling is certain. So I need to, I sit with it, like that feeling, that thought, like, where is this coming from? Why did this trigger? It's a trigger. It's a pattern. It's a, it's a repetition from somewhere in life. Right. And so for me, when, when I had that thought a little bit ago, it was stress was, I was so stressed out from COVID, from the book, from all these things in a certain amount of time that I haven't done with in a while that I never gave myself permission to just like, just chill out. And so the, the addictive personality in me is like, go, go, go. Okay. Run, you know? Mm. Um, so that's what I'm learning to do is to narrow those thoughts and be more aware of them. I don't think they're ever going to go away. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that, there's a great book. I don't know if you ever read it. It's called Feeding Your Demons. Uh, I haven't heard of that one, no. And she walks you through a meditative process as a five-step process. Basically, you, you would want to do it with someone professionally if you've never done it before. And you get a journal for it and you sit there and you befriend your demon. So like in this case, let's just say it's alcohol. So, you know, what does the demon want from you? What does alcohol want from you? What does it need from you? How can you give it what you want? Not necessarily by like, alcohol but like the feelings underlying that right you just go through and you walk it then you give it heads you give it colors and you and then you ally it and all the thing you know it gets better and better right wow so. wow that's pretty powerful stuff i want to ask i think you've given you, you know some some good advice here and shared some uh some pretty cool tools with the listeners today but if there's maybe one piece of advice that you'd like to share with the sober nation whether it's someone that is uh, thinking about getting sober, uh, newly sober and having a tough time, kind of like in that transition, right? Um, mm. Or maybe has, has been sober for a little while and is just kind of struggling to, uh, as you put it, kind of like become their, their best self, right? Yeah, so I would say that recognizing that life is and will always be like a hum of things, meaning that we will always be surrounded by this clutter of things, right? Friends, family, work, stresses, whatever it is, all these, these things that we have to deal with. In that process, we have to learn that we are so much more powerful than we allow ourselves to be. And so when we can take a step back, you know, take a breath, call someone journal, whatever it is that you want to do to help you move through it, you can get out of your head and into your heart and see that what you are made of is meant to come through, but only if you accept all of who you are versus trying to rip it out and run and be all these things that you're not meant to be, right? So it's hidden underneath the surface of it all. Hmm. And so taking a step back every single day and asking yourself, who are you? What's going really well in your life and why? And reminding yourself. And then next thing you know, it's like an accumulation of like awesome things that are happening for you. Man, that's awesome advice. I really love that. I love that. So you can learn more about George by visiting the art of tough transitions.com. Be sure to look out for his book, know where to go, uh, which is going to be released in August or early September. Thanks again for coming on the show, George. Man, this is a blast. Yeah. Let me know if I can help you anyway, man. I'd love to do it again sometime. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the info from today's episode. Sober Nation FM is brought to you by Sobriety Engine. Sobriety Engine is a free online community of men and women supporting each other in their recovery. Visit sobrietyengine.com to join today. This show is also brought to you by Recover Health. If you're ready to get fit and start living a healthier lifestyle while supporting your sobriety, you can learn more about having me as your own personal fitness and nutrition coach at rcvrhealth.com. And again, whether you're listening to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or watching on YouTube, please share this with your friends, follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. Nation, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.